Amen. Good morning. Welcome. It's good to see everybody this morning. Happy Palm Sunday to you all. It seems like longer than just a year ago we couldn't do Palm Sunday, doesn't it? Good heavens. It's good to be back, though. Uh, a few announcements for you this morning. Uh, youth group, senior high youth group this morning is meeting at the Westcombe at 11.30 to go to York to visit the Story of the Bible exhibit at the college up there. Next, well, this is the beginning of Holy Week, and we'll have worship service on Thursday night with communion at 7 o'clock and worship on Good Friday at 7 o'clock. And then, of course, next Sunday morning is Resurrection Day, and we do need you to make a reservation, please. We make sure we have room for everybody. Contact the church office during the week to put your name down. Also, if you would like to provide an Easter lily, you can do that. Uh, pick one up at the store or order one and have it delivered by Friday. And then if you would like that in memory or honor of someone, please contact the church office so we can make note of that. Uh, starting on the 13th of April, on Tuesday mornings, uh, Bible study, Hebrews, Grace and Gratitude. If you would like to participate in that, we'll be at 9 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. Please contact the church office by Thursday so those books can be ordered. Scholarship time is upon us and the applications are available in the church office for anybody who's going to be attending a school of higher education next year. Uh, those are due by Friday, April 9th at 3 o'clock p.m. in the church office. Starting on April 11th, that's, uh, let's see, two weeks from today, Sunday school from kindergarten through eighth grade will resume in a little bit different format. They will meet from 9.45 to 10.15 in the fellowship hall following worship. So put that on your calendar. If you have not sent in your pledge for uh, UMW, you can still send that to Carol Hendrick, or you can drop it off to the church office, or throw it in the offering plate as you come in. Just make sure that it's marked UMW Pledge. Starting next Sunday, we will have the buckets out for Change for Change. They'll be available in the narthex. We're still not going to be passing anything around through the pews, but we will be collecting loose change next month for UMCOR. So if you have spare change lying around your house or your car or your purse, feel free to bring that in and lighten your load just a little bit. Let us stand and uh, join together in our call to worship. Good morning. Good morning. Oh God, you are my God. I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please join me in the hymn Hosanna, loud Hosanna. <laughs>
could please join me in the opening prayer. God of salvation, our Lord entered his passion to raise us to life. In this holiest of weeks, help us to walk the way of the cross, that we may be raised in a resurrection like his and dwell forever in you, eternal God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. You may be seated. Our gospel this morning is taken from the 11th chapter of the gospel according to Mark. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They said to them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat upon it. Many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Here ends the reading of the word. May God bless its reading and our hearing it. Let us remain seated as we sing together. Tell me the stories of Jesus. Thank you. 
Well, as we have already talked about a little bit and sung about, today is Palm Sunday, the day we remember Jesus' triumphant re-entry into Jerusalem. And a lot of times in many churches, the liturgy of the palms is included with the liturgy of the Passion, and that is uh, oftentimes when a church does not observe Maundy Thursday or Good Friday specifically, and so Palm Sunday includes Palm Sunday, the Last Supper, and the Crucifixion, and then you just jump to next Sunday, which is Easter, but I'm not like that, so I won't do that. So here we are on Palm Sunday, and we're stopping with Palm Sunday today, and it's important to stop and consider Palm Sunday in and of itself because it should not, it should not be trivialized, it should not be minimized, because there's a whole lot going on here. How many of us, when we were kids, uh, were involved in palm parades, walking around the sanctuary, waving all palm, right? And it seems weird to not have that, but it's less weird this year than it was last year when it was just Ben and Kim and Maddie and I videotaping something. It was just, it was just weird, and it's still a little bit weird, but that's just the way it is. But as weird as it is for us, imagine how weird it was for the Pharisees to see this parade going on. Now... As I said, there's a lot more going on than meets the eye, and it reminds me, now I know that um, Dr. Seuss has been in the news lately, and I'm not going to get into all of that, but I will simply lift up the fact that many of Dr. Seuss's books <clears throat> were rather political in nature and kind of pushed the envelope of social norms, and that happens across, across a spectrum of different things. And one of them is actually the Wizard of Oz. Maybe some of you are aware of this. We've all seen the Wizard of Oz. How many of us have read the Wizard of Oz? One, two, three, four, a few, five. Thank you, Jen. Um, Frank L. Baum wrote this. Oh, gosh. When was it? Those of you that read it. Remember the cover page? What was the copyright? Anybody? I didn't plan on talking about this. It just hit me as we were singing. Um, late 1800s, early 1900s. And when he wrote it, there was a great debate going on in Washington, if you can imagine such a thing. They were trying to decide if they should use gold or silver as the, the standard for the dollar bill. And so he wrote this book as kind of a political statement. And in the book, what we know as the ruby slippers, they're not ruby at all. They are so I didn't see you raise your hand that you'd read it. Did. You didn't? You just knew that. Cliff's Notes. Cliff's Notes. All right, that works. We call them spark notes now, don't we? Okay. Her slippers were silver, and they were meant to walk on the yellow brick road, which, of course, symbolized gold, because symbol, silver was superior to gold. Aren't, aren't you glad you came to church this morning? <laughs> and what city on the, in, in the east do you suppose was symbolized by the Emerald City? D.C., absolutely. And who do you suppose the fake wizard represented? Politicians in general, because they just couldn't be trusted, and they were all phony. And I'm sure there's probably more to that than I'm even aware of, but I just remember those. There's just more to it. I remember watching that back in the day before VCRs. Anybody remember that? <laughs> wizard of Oz was on about once a year, and we used to beg my parents, can we please stay up and watch it? Because, of course, with commercials, it took 12 and a half hours to watch the whole thing. And so we got to watch it once a year. I had no idea all that other stuff was going on. But it's just interesting to consider all of the underlying notions and ideas and things. And that's what's going on with Jesus coming into Jerusalem that day. This is perhaps one of the most politically charged and explosive acts of Jesus' ministry. The other one that I can think of is when he flips the tables over in the temple. Of course, that was kind of an explosive day as well. But when he comes into Jerusalem, he is lampooning the political powers via a very carefully organized and planned carnival-like military procession that has critical implications all throughout it. Now, if we go through that, that passage again, you know, we think, oh yeah, that's the passage about Palm Sunday, but there's only four verses that actually talk about the parade, but there are seven verses that talk about how it was planned ahead of time. This didn't just happen on a spur of the moment. It wasn't like Jesus, oh yeah, let's just go into Jerusalem this morning. You know, No, 
There was all of these plans that were laid out. He told the disciples where to go to get this donkey, to get the colt. He clearly had been there and told the people he was going to send them and so on and so forth. It wasn't, it wasn't just haphazardly slapped slap together. It was, it was planned and it was carefully orchestrated. It was kind of street theater, so to speak. It was a parody of, of kingship that the world had come to understand and know, and in some cases, fear. Now, he begins at the Mount of Olives, and that has symbolism in and of itself because the Jews believed that that was the site where the battle would begin for the liberation of Jerusalem. That wasn't it wasn't just happened to be that's where his Airbnb was and that's where they started. It was quite intentional that they would begin in that particular site. He sends for provisions for this parade, this entry of a king, but he doesn't send for weapons of war. He sends for the colt of a donkey, not even a horse, not some kind of a great stallion that had seen battle. All he wants is the colt of a donkey. Now, throughout this procession, there's all, this, all the similar trappings of a great military procession for a triumphant national hero. Think, if you will, imagine just a moment, remember the old newsreels of ticker tape parades in New York City? That's kind of how it was. I mean, clearly there was no ticker tape, but that's as much fervor and excitement as there was in the crowd that Jesus was coming in to Jerusalem. They had their branches and their cloaks spread on the ground. They were shouting, Hosanna, which means save, we pray. And the question then is, well, who were they asking him to save them from? Was it from sin? Was it from themselves? Was it from the Romans? Was it from the Pharisees? And the answer is probably yes, all of those things. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They were declaring that he was coming in the name of God. God saves. Long live the king. These are all things that would have been seen and heard as subversive and even treasonous to the powers that be in those days. This parade, as, as nostalgic and romantic as we can imagine it, you know, there's Jesus coming into town on the back of a dog. Isn't that just a nice picture? We've all seen paintings of that before, but it is political satire at its greatest. He is lampooning the powers that be and their pretensions and their quest for power, for glory, and for tom domination because he is saying here, I have got a better way. God has got a better way. But he doesn't do this in a way that, that, that Lord's authority over others. He is not mean. He is not nasty. He's got a rejection of domination going on here that he lived all through his life, and he continues to do that now. There is no pomp. There is no wealth. He is identifying himself here with the poorest of the poor. It wasn't the rich and wealthy that came out to, to cheer him into Jerusalem. It was the throngs of people, everyday people, normal people, he did not come in as a warrior. He came in rejecting violence. And he's inviting the world to look at things in a new and different way. Another, I mentioned a ticker tape parade. Another way to maybe imagine this would be, you've seen uh, videos of parades in New Orleans, you know, with the Dixieland band and the, and the, the guy with the umbrella at the beginning, you know, something kind of like that. It's very, very different than what they expected their king to be. And it certainly was not what the Pharisees expected or wanted to see. But all these people are yelling, save, we pray. And again, the question is, save from what? Every year on Palm Sunday, we sing these hymns and we say, Hosanna. What is it that we are asking Jesus to save us from? What are the powers of this world that have gotten us down? We don't live in a world where we're under Roman occupation. We don't have the Pharisees telling us that God doesn't love us if we don't follow every last little law. 
But all of us need to be saved. We need to be freed. We need to be liberated from something in our lives. And so we say these things, and it's important to stop and consider what is it that we're asking God to save us from. Now, we know what's coming later in this week. Sometimes we don't like to think about it. Sometimes we do like to just skip right from Palm Sunday to Easter and not think about the pain in between. And we know that there is forgiveness. We know that there's an opportunity for eternity in the kingdom of heaven. But we also know that there are things in this world that get us down. There are things in this world that cause us problems. There are things in this world that we grieve over and that we suffer from. And when we say Hosanna, and we remember this parade, that Jesus presented himself as the king in a way that kind of stuck in the craw of those who were in power, when we say that, it's a reclaiming of our own discipleship. It's a rededication of ourselves, saying that, This is who we're going to live under. It is under Jesus. It is under God. It is under this new way of peace and of love. That we're not going to succumb to the ways of the world that say this when God says that. It's a renewed commitment today for us. For our own discipleship, our own walk of faith, our own effort to live into the example of Christ. Yeah, this was, this was not all just circumstance. It wasn't, oh, that's just the way it happened to fall together. I believe that it was very carefully planned out. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He may not have known exactly how the crowd was going to respond. Those who were in power, they said, tell this crowd to be quiet, Jesus. And he responded, well, yeah, I could tell them to be quiet, but then the very rocks would shout out. Some things are beyond our control, Jesus says. The Pharisees didn't like it. They wanted to retain their power. But Jesus knew that God had other plans. And the crowd was beginning to understand that Jesus shared a different vision. Absolutely. Yay. Thank God that God has a better plan for us. Thank God that we don't have to live under the rules of society. Yes, there are laws. We have to obey the law, but you know what I mean. Society tells us to put ourselves first, to beat down the other person, to criticize, to ridicule, to hate. But those are not the things that God calls us to do. And so when we say Hosanna today, let us be mindful that God can and will save us from the garbage that society tells us is good enough. He came into town riding on the back of a donkey. They expected this great military king. They'd been waiting for the Messiah for hundreds of years, and they expected this mighty warrior king with legions of of warriors surrounding him with flags flying, And as I said, on this probably beautiful horse. And here he comes on the back of a donkey. Not what they expected. But I would remind us all, God continues to come to us in ways that we don't always expect. But that doesn't make it any less real. As we move forward into this holy week, let us remember to say Hosanna each and every day. As we rededicate ourselves, as we recommit ourselves to the discipleship, to which God has called us all. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer this morning, we continue to pray for the family of Doris Moravik, for John Power, for Marlene Shademan, and all those whose lives continue to be affected by COVID-19. Let us pray.
Almighty God, you've sent your Son to be our King, who's come in your name to bring peace on heaven and earth. We join with those voices of old in singing Hosanna as our canticle of praise. You've called us to be your chosen people, but so often, God, we've been unfaithful in following your ways. What we say with our lips is not matched by our deeds. We have denied your son by failing to accept the new way of life that he came to bring. Have mercy upon us and forgive our sin and wash away our iniquity. Fill us with your spirit and send us forth from this place inspired by the great and wonderful gift of salvation that we might call the world to your feet. Wash away the suffering of those whose names we carry in our hearts. Restore them to well-being and let them proclaim your greatness. Receive these things we ask and grant them, not for our sake, but for the sake of him who gave himself to take away our sin. Jesus Christ, the Lord, who taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand if you're comfortably able as we sing together all glory, laud, and honor.
now into the world, into this holy week, with Hosanna upon your lips and a rededication within your heart. Go in peace. Thank you.